Okay, this is Matt Brown of Filter Systems here at Schroeder. Today we're going to be going over our new NAV 5 GPM vacuum dehydrator. First off, we had great success with the NAV 30 GPM dehydrator. We're now offering a 5 GPM version of it. And this is mainly to work with customers that have smaller reservoirs, roughly under 600 gallons. And the NAV with its high dirt holding capacity elements will re effectively remove free water, absorb water, particulate, and gas contamination. NAV was pretty much designed for long-term permanent installations on reservoirs that have a constant ingression of water, a high ingression, or, you know, it is based on wheels and we can use it on multiple reservoirs at a larger facility. It's one of our power hitters on heavy water removing ability. I'm gonna spend some time in discussing, you know, what is you know, the vacuum dehydrator versus our mass transfer Triton units. And basically the NAV, we're using a vacuum pump to create a uh, vacuum in the chamber, which will ex in turn expand the air and dry it. And what that is allowing is allowing mass transfer to occur in the reaction chamber where the water and the oil transfers to the air and expelled from the system. Now its purpose is really to provide very dry oil very clean oil for the fluid system. It's totally self-contained, PLC operated, and it's also portable where it can be moved to different reservoir locations as well. Now, with the vacuum dehydrator, the big difference between the vacuum dehydrator and our Triton units is the vacuum dehydrator will remove gaseous contamination. So if you have transformer type oil that needs to be degassed, we would require that you go with a vacuum dehydrator on that. And we also see it on certain military and certain industries where they do get a gas contamination in their fluid and needs to be removed. Now, the vacuum dehydrators, with the methods that they employ, will get very, very dry. And I'm talking down in the single digits of saturation, single digits of PPMs, you know, 5, 10 PPM of water. We are using a high efficiency QF filter on there. We can get uh, 1412 or better particulate cleanliness to it. And we're also going to accomplish this without excessive heat or a high vacuum. Uh, when we start talking about vacuum dehydrators, there's really two different types. A high vacuum, high heat unit, which a lot of our competitors use. And then what we typically refer to as a mass transfer, which is using low vacuum, low heat to remove that water. NEV can be used with a lot of different fluids come standard with Viton seals on that and very, very little user interface is required. There is a manual adjustment to the vacuum. You have to adjust that by hand and it really does not require that. It's adjusted on a hourly basis on that. It's usually done over a period of days where we actually are adjusting the vacuum. You start off with a low vacuum of say somewhere around 17 inches of vacuum on uh, when a fluid is really wet and saturated and has free water presence. Once we broach saturation level, then we'll slowly increase the vacuum, get it up to about 19, 20, 21 inches. And that's where we're going to be pulling out the uh, absorbed water that's in that fluid. When we install our NAVs, these need to be a kidney loop manner. They really cannot be installed in line into a pressure line. These units are totally self-contained, designed to run unattended in between the uh, maintenance schedule intervals. And the water sensor that's installed on there, you can tap off of the outputs and they can put it into their plant's PLC and actually see what water content is on an updated basis. A person that has water contamination, you know, when, when they go in to install the dehydrator, dehydrator is there essentially to remove the water. But what we also want to do is when we sell these units is really find out where is the source of their contamination coming from. Do they not have sealed vents on the tank? Are they not using desiccant breathers? We get a lot of water coming in from coolers and heat exchangers. A lot of times the customer will be running this unit to keep their system operational until they can replace their coolers. We also see it water will precipitate in the tank due to temperature fluctuations, especially at this type of year where they're actually running at 140 degrees in their plant. They shut it down, zero degrees outside, plant gets cold, and then we start seeing condensation inside the tank. 
We see it also when they top off the tanks with new fluid and it's contaminated fluid with water. Believe it or not, we also see it from rain. We see where external reservoirs outside that are actually getting rain and moisture entering there. And also through plant washdowns, we see a lot of leaky seals and stuff throughout the plant. They end up getting water that way. The effects of water contamination are all over the board. You guys will see it in corrosion on the component surfaces. There's going to be a fluid degradation of it. We're also going to see a precipitation of the additives in the fluid. You're going to see an oxidation of the fluid. Icing at low temperatures, that water that's in that oil, absorbed free water will start freezing up. But then when you have a high water content in the oil, you also see a promotion of bacterial growth and or varnish issues starting to occur because of that. Now, all oils have different saturation levels. Hydraulic fluids typically run somewhere around 200 to 400 ppms. And this will be the level of once they exceed, you start seeing free water in it. Lubrication systems generally have a little bit higher. They can go up to about 750, 800 ppm before free water absorbs. But then in a transformer application, it's got to be very dry on that. And we've seen, you know, some fluids, you know, really at about 10 ppm, they start having issues on the transformers. 50 ppm, you're starting to get really wet on those transformers and they got to get them dry. So the fluids are a little bit different, but our saturation sensor will work essentially the same. It's going to let them know before the actual free water appears. Now, one thing about oil is it's affected by temperature. As that fluid heats up, its ability to hold more moisture increases. The free water is on the left on this diagram. Dissolved water is on the right. So as they heat their system up, that saturation level is actually going to go down. The PPM is essentially staying the same at rest. And then basically as they start heating it up, they had free water at rest as they heat it up. That water gets absorbed back in the oil, and then you start seeing that, you know, at 125 degrees, it's essentially 50% saturated at that point. When they cool the system back down, you'll start seeing free water present again. In this customer's application with this type of fluid, looking at this curve, my recommendation to them is going to be we want to keep this fluid somewhere around below 50 ppm, roughly around 25, if not slightly below. So there's no free water present when the system's at rest. Now, when you have free and dissolved water in their oil, the coalescers, absorption technology, and centrifuges, they're all very good and they can remove that free water. They're not going to be able to remove the dissolved water. They'll take it down to that 100% saturation level. They won't be able to go down to the right of this curve on that. Now, if you've got a turbine lube system, they're recommending on turbines to be at 50% saturation or below at the operating temperature. I prefer to actually see it lower, but they also have an ingression going on typically at these turbines on there. But as low as you can get it on the turbine, the better for it. The different technologies that are involved for water removal, you've got the coalescers. They're going to remove free water only, but they're not going to get it below the saturation point of the fluid. Somewhat cost effective because you don't have to replace them as long as they're kept free of particulate. Centrifugal separation, same as the above, very efficient at removing free water, but it's not going to get the absorbed water. Centrifuges do require a tremendous amount of maintenance, power, and they're very expensive. The absorption technology, Probably the most cost effective of removing the free water in a sense. It's very cheap, but the elements don't hold a lot of water. You've got to replace a lot of the elements. Then we start moving into what we call flash distillation, which is the high heat, high vacuum type dehydration. And they'll remove the free and dissolved water, but they do use high heat. Usually it's above 150 degrees F, and they do use high vacuum. I've seen them as high as 30 inches of vacuum, but generally anything above 25 inches is what we would consider a flash distillation unit. And essentially what they're doing is they're injecting that oil in the reaction chamber and basically boiling it off and pulling it out with the vacuum pump on that. Does stress the oil. You're going to have a thermal oxidation breakdown eventually if you keep running it at flash distillation. 
And what we use on our NAV is, you know, a mass diffusion type dehydrator. We'll remove free and dissolved water, but we're going to do it with moderate heat and a much lower vacuum, typically around 18 to 20 inches of vacuum. We only really need 125 degrees of temperature. Gets a little faster at water removal up to 140, but that's really all the temperature that we need to do it. And we're basically lowering the separation phase of the water in the oil and we'll pull it out that way. Now, the way our vacuum dehydrator, the principle works is our reaction chamber right here in the middle, blue is the actual fluid. It's going through the heater first and it enters into the reaction chamber. We have a packed media in there that creates a surface area, thins that oil out and we get an increased surface area of the oil interacts with the air that's in the reaction chamber in the vacuum. It's actually expanded when it goes into that chamber. When it's placed into a vacuum, it might expand four or five times. In that expansion, the air is drying out. That dry air gets in contact with that wet oil, absorbs most of the moisture that way through the air and is expelled out. We do have a uh, collection a tank for this free water that we can uh, collect and dispose of or we can actually run a hose to it and put it into a slosh tank if needed when it's constant basis. Here's a picture inside of the rings. These rings actually, the oil coats on it as it cascades down, gives you a much bigger surface area on it. That's why our reaction chamber is a little bit large. We need that surface area to it. And then we'll have mass transfer occur, pull most of that moisture out right there through the air. And then as we dry out that oil and really need to get it down to PPMs, we increase that vacuum up to about 20, 21 inches and we start drawing out the moisture that way. Nice thing about these, they really don't require maintenance. They need a flush out. We can flush it out with a, a thin fluid and get the contaminant. But it's not like you have to do this on a monthly basis or anything. If you take really, really contaminated, dirty oil with high particulate, you might need to flush it out at that point but you don't need to dispose of it. Now, a lot of strengths come up with the mass transfer diffusion method. We're gonna remove free dissolved water gases, get it much below the saturation point. We can also drop it into single digits, a viscosity range up to 700 centistokes. Very low maintenance on it. The vacuum pump only requires an annual oil change based upon about 7,000 hours. And then you have your intake breather and your particulate elements. That's really your maintenance that's used on this. It's very efficient at a lower heat and low vacuum. It has a high uptime reliability, ease of use and performance. All of our testing methods on the water removal rates are going to be used per the ISO standards. We're starting to see other manufacturers go by this, which is good because competitors' water removal rates are all over the place stating, you know, we can remove up to 50 gallons. That's under certain circumstances, not real world circumstances. Now, when we get to the NAVs type units, generally they have a higher capital cost compared to the other technologies such as coalescing and absorption. It is slightly more than our mass transfer Triton units, but it's also gonna have a better performance of degassing and dropping that saturation level down to single digits. The Tritons kind of stop at about 10, 11% saturation, which is very dry. Usually need to only be down to about 20%. We, got, we can take it down to 10. But if you need to go to that real low saturation level, you're going to have to employ a vacuum type dehydrator. Now, when we go against the flash distillation units, we can pull out the, the free and absolved water, same methods, but we don't have any maintenance required in our uh, reaction chamber. Those dispersal elements that are employed are somewhat expensive. I've seen them up to 200 bucks a piece. And if you got six of them, you know, you're up to $1,200 in elements on, on a maintenance schedule for it. So it adds up over a period of time. And once again, the high heat, you know, you're going to need some amperage to run that unit if you got 96 kW of heat on there. So there are some pluses when you go with ours on that method. Now, as you see in the specs, there's not a whole lot of difference on the NAV5 and NAV30. Basically, it's a couple inches uh, narrower, three inches narrower, about 10 inches less in length and height. But look at the weight, you know, it's, it's only about 400 pounds difference on there. 
it's still a big piece of equipment. Okay, so if any, anybody has any other questions, feel free to contact myself or Chris Mikulin. We can walk you through it and go from there. Thanks for your time, everyone.